Well, welcome everybody to this afternoon's um, discussion about Malaysia in deluge, I suppose, both metaphorically and uh, literally right now, unfortunately. Um, we're going to try and get through as many themes and topologies, I suppose, about the 15th general election as possible. Uh, and with us here today, uh, we have uh, Professor James Chin, University of Tasmania, who is in Kuala Lumpur at the moment, Ira Azari, who is a Fulbright scholar and at Ideas, but she is in New York right now joining us before she hops on a plane back to KL. And Dr. Greg Lopez from Murdoch University, who is in Perth right now. And uh, we're here at Sydney University on Gadigal land. We will start, first of all, with um, our participants, Professor Chin, Dr. Lopez, Ms. Ira, with a couple of opening statements. And then I think we'll try and uh, keep this as loose but informative as possible and have an open discussion. Um, perhaps uh, we could start with James, who is in KL right now, who could tell us a bit about how the election campaign is going since it's officially started. And uh, he's been traveling from Sabah all the way to the peninsula. James? Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much, uh, Kin, for your kind introduction. And thank you for uh, University of Sydney and Massa for the kind invitation for me to take part in this webinar. So perhaps before I talk about my travels, I'll start off with uh, some of the uh, uh, important things about this election. I think there's sort of four or five really important things about this election before we actually get the discussion started. Uh, the first is that this is the first uh, election since the pandemic. So I think it's crucially important because the pandemic has really damaged Malaysia's economy. Uh, so people are looking towards the new government uh, in terms of uh, bringing the country back to some sort of normality, especially uh, economic growth, uh, jobs, prosperity. Uh, if you go around Kuala Lumpur, you'll find that you know, everything is really, really expensive and a lot of people are actually struggling, including the middle class. Secondly, I think the election is very different from all the previous elections in Malaysia, in the sense that if you look at all the previous elections in Malaysia, you always had one dominant coalition or one dominant party uh, going into the elections. Uh, this time, it is widely accepted that there were uh, three uh, key players. There's no more one dominant player. Uh, you have the Barisan National, you have the Perikatan National, and of course, you have the Pakatan Harapan. So I think that is uh, quite different in terms of thinking uh, towards uh, the election. The third point is linked to the first point is that people are really looking for political stability. Again, this has never happened in Malaysia's political history. When you talk to the people here, they talk about how difficult it has been for the last four years, where you had uh, three different administrations and three different prime ministers. And the fourth point, of course, is something that is not widely known, even uh, people are not talking about in Malaysia and it's linked to point number three, the issue of political stability. Uh, unfortunately, the people looking for political stability are only the people on the Malayan side or the peninsula side. Uh, I can tell you that the people in Sabah and Sarawak may not be totally in agreement when it comes to political stability. Because when you talk about political stability, you're talking about a very strong coalition that will emerge from the uh, Malayan side. The people of Sabah and Sarawak may not like that very much. Uh, the reason is because they're hoping that you won't have a clear winner on the peninsula side. So you will rely on the MPs of political strength from Sabah and Sarawak to form or stay in government. Uh, the reason they want that is because they're still trying to sort out the uh, MA63 uh, and other political concessions. But more importantly, they felt that they've been marginalized for the last 50 years. So it's really time to leverage on their political strength in order to get maximum concessions uh, from the Malayan side. So I think this is one of the key points that a lot of people have missed out. And this is consistent with what we know about Malaysian studies and that Sabah and Surah has been marginalized for a very, very long time until I came along, <laughs> but never mind. But in terms of the impressions is that uh, after about a week of campaigning, you'll find that the political climate here is still very cold. 
if you go around Kuala Lumpur, there's hardly any what we call the flat walls. Uh, there's a, there is a lot of political activities going on, but there's mostly small gatherings. Uh, there hasn't been any so-called uh, uh, big rallies. Uh, that is the hallmark of the opposition. Uh, but the big thing I've noticed that is different from 2018 uh, this time is that uh, the political parties are spending a lot of money and a lot of resources into what we call the new voters. As many of you in this seminar knows, uh, Malaysia amended the constitution and there was suddenly about 7 million new voters uh, on the electoral roll. The bulk of them are what we call the 18, 19, 20 year olds. So a lot of money has been gone in the social media, especially in terms of producing TikTok videos. I don't remember seeing a political TikTok videos or short videos back in 2018. Uh, but today, if you go around all the major social uh, things like Telegram, WhatsApp, you find you know there are all sorts of TikTok videos. And even some of the older candidates, for example, there was a candidate uh, who is more than 70 years old. Uh, he's producing a lot of TikTok videos. So you can see that you know everybody thinks that they have to go all up to capture the, the, the U-vote. Uh, the only final comment I've made is that uh, I haven't seen any big money being thrown around yet, but I suspect all the political parties are holding off with the final week of campaigning because the political climate is very cold. Uh, most of them are thinking that a lot of people are undecided, so we better do the big push uh, in this coming week, which is the final week. So I expect a lot of resources, a lot of money, a lot of things to happen probably from Tuesday onwards. And there will be all sorts of things happening on Thursday and Friday for the big push for Saturday morning. Thank you. Great. Thanks, James. Um, it's good that you raised a couple of the issues there, like um, political financing, the amount of money being thrown about, uh, the aftermath of, I guess, uh, a couple of years of pandemic and lockdowns and how everyone has sort of migrated their conversations online and the rise and rise of, I guess, the mobile phone derived um, conversations and uh, propaganda. Um, and maybe as well that um, this so-called youth voter demographic because of the changes uh, brought on by UNDI 18 and uh, the automatic registration um, actually speaks quite a lot to what has been um, a very popular um, episode in our podcast series, uh, Malaysia and Deluge, which Ira Azhari uh, has um, had several comments about, I think, about um, some of her views and her insights into how things are going uh, both in the financing front as well as what this new 6 million plus strong cohort of voters coming in are going to mean. Ira, um, maybe you want to you know, sketch a, a picture for us as to how things look from your end. Uh, thanks, thanks, Kim. Thanks, everyone. Um, hi, uh, I guess it's uh, the, the day is just turning here in uh, New York. Uh, it's, uh, it's about midnight here. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm glad that uh, Prof. James brought up the issue of uh, financing and also the sort of lackluster um, campaign atmosphere so far. I have read uh, some analysts saying the same. So, with regards to financing, um, actually, I just read an article on the Vibes uh, about how uh, AMNO is actually more cash strapped uh, this time in, in this election and are not able to spend as lavishly as they usually do on campaigns, which uh, probably explains why uh, you know, there are not as many flags as there are in previous elections. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting article uh, where uh, you know, it was the article was mentioning. They, I mean, they interviewed several people who, you know, obviously want to remain anonymous, but you know, saying that each division used to get about three million ringgit, but now it's down to one million. And uh, Amno is a party that, you know, if you want people to go out there and do the pachak bendera, um, they need to be paid, right? So uh, when there's no money for that, then you know that explains why uh, we don't, probably don't see as much of that. Um, uh, that's that's an interesting um, point uh, and something interesting to observe. Um, and I guess when it comes to financing, 
I'm also quite interested to see how, uh, yeah, the, the uh, newest party on the block, uh, which is Muda, uh, you know, a, a combi and Muda is a party that, you know, a combination of being new, but also um, consisting mostly of uh, young people with uh, sort of more activist backgrounds who do not have the same access to money and to business networks as, um, you know, uh, a lot of the more established parties, right? So it will be interesting to see and to observe uh, how how they raise funds and how they spend that money um, with their six candidates, I believe, uh, running in this election. Um, I guess I just want to touch on just two more things on the youth factor. Um, I always get asked this question, you know, um, which party or which coalition are young people going to go for? Um, you know, are young people uh, sort of politically aware, educated enough to make uh, choices during the election? And what I always say is that uh, young people might be disillusioned with partisan politics. Uh, I mean, honestly, I think who isn't? <laughs> A lot of people in Malaysia are, not just young people. Um, but it doesn't mean that young people are not engaged in issues, in political issues, right? So young people has been, have been at the forefront of um, so many causes that we've seen in, for the last two to three years. Um, the Lawan protests, the Hartal Doctor contract protests, um, the protests on food prices, I believe, uh, that was more recent. Uh, so yeah, young people are at the forefront of all of those causes, and you know those protests would not have happened without the mobilization and uh, yeah, organization of young people, really. Um, but you know who they're going to vote for? I mean, that remains to be seen, and I think the challenge is on to the political parties to make their case on why is politics a platform uh, that young people should believe in to uh, for for those all these changes that they want to see happen in the country. And I guess just my third point is, um, I think this election more than, or maybe maybe it's just me, but I feel like more than the other elections previously, um, this issue of candidate selection has really just exploded out into the open um, uh, across all parties, right? And I'm sure candidate selection has been, you know, a, a, a huge battleground in all parties for a long time, but I think now because of media exposure or social media or the fragmentation of parties, um, it's just really gone, you know, to the forefront um, across all parties. So obviously in AMNO, you know, there was, you know, this so-called big purge of uh, the sort of pro Ismail Sabri faction and all that. But I think this whole fiasco in candidate selection really, I think is, it's, I, I, I like it that it's been brought up to the forefront so much because it really exposes how um, I think if politics in Malaysia is going to change, then political, we need to have a conversation about political parties and just how they are structured and how candidates are selected. Because unless we do that, then you know, we'll, we'll never have young and new fresh blood in, in, you know, in our politics, right? So yeah, so I think that's a really interesting Thing and I, I hope that you know all the scholars and PhD students studying this election will will write something about that. I'm really looking forward to um to to delve into that actually. So yeah, I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thanks, Ira, for helping us um get a better picture on that. Um, I, I was just curious uh when you mentioned you know some of these new coalitions uh emerging and also the candidate fiasco, as you put it. Um, a lot of that seems to, I guess, speak to some of the conversations that uh, Greg and I had been having recently, arising from our podcast as well, and speaking to economists um, about where the Malaysian economy needs to go after basically pretty grim times the last few years and only saved in a way by the commodities oil and gas boom lately. But um, it also seems to suggest that if the 2018 elections was the culmination of a lot of hope after two plus decades of reformacy, what does uh, the 2022 G15 promise us, Greg? I mean, you, you've actually sketched out this uh, interesting array of at least three possible coalitions going on right now. 
Yeah, thanks, Ken. Um, uh, um, James mentioned that uh, this uh, election is is unique because there is no dominant party or coalition. Um, it's a very important point. Um, and there is actually no point on very difficult to differentiate between the current coalitions. And then Ira mentioned uh, sort of the, the challenges within the, the political parties. I'd like to offer a sort of a, 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 a general framework, how, how we could look at these issues. And then I will then dovetail into sort of the longer term issues that Malaysia faces. So I'll talk about leadership and very quickly, leadership in political parties and coalition, the ideology uh, of these coalitions, how they have these three coalitions uh, managed the Malaysian economy over the past four years, and, and how, how do they see uh, Malaysia going uh, from GE15 onwards. So there's this famous, there are this, um, you know, you can find this uh, on Twitter. Uh, we, we've got Parak Pakatan Harapan, we've got Perikatan National, Barisan National, Gerakan Tanah Air, and then uh, in the Bonio states, uh, Gabungan Pati Sarwa and Gabungan Rakyat uh, Sabah, Rakyat Sabah. So, you know, the, if it was not already confusing, uh, with the number of candidates, uh, just this, this you know, the sheer number of uh, political parties tell, tells you the story. Now, so how do how how would you look at all these coalitions? So I'm going to only look at uh, sort of the four main or the three main coalition. So number one, leadership of the political parties or the coalition. <clears throat> Uh, I would consider Perikatan National uh, uh, as a very authoritarian political party. So, PAS, um, you know, it's it's Abdul Hadi Awang's party. Um, he has purged the moderates uh, out of of PAS, and people who dissent uh, his views uh, uh, have been kicked out. Uh, Bersatu, well, Muhyiddin's party, um, he was perhaps the most authoritarian prime minister. Uh, he suspended parliament. Um, never has that happened uh, si since Tun Razak's time after May 13. And then if you put Gerakan Tanah Air, Air together, and I put GTA together because although they, they are a loose coalition themselves, uh, their ideology and, and the leader of Gerakan Tanah Air, which is Tun Mahade, he is vehemently against Amno, And we also know he's vehemently against Anwar Ibrahim. So GTA, I suspect, has some informal agreement with Prikata National um, uh, to work together. Um, <clears throat> in terms of ideology, well, uh, Perikatan National and Gerakan Tanah Air is the consolidation of all right-wing Malay and Islamic uh, parties. Okay, so if you look at Pejuang, Gagasan Bangsa, which includes Isma, uh, Putra Pati, uh, Putra Pekasa Malaysia, Iman, Berjasa, these are all right-wing uh, Malay Muslim parties. Um, and if you if you take the ideologues behind uh, this uh, this political parties, people like Marzuki Muhammad, Wan Fashal, uh, Muhammad Abdul Khalid, uh, these are these are individuals who talk about uh, bangsa Melayu, bangsa Teras, um, uh, greater uh, Bumi Putra, uh, code for Malay, uh, uh, support for 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 Malay, uh, the Malay agenda, so. They would be the, in, in, in my view, um, communalism um, uh, at its, it, its furthest right. Now, Barisan National, as, as we know, uh, has been the vehicle to mediate this communalism. Um, 
over time with the strength of AMNO, uh, they've moved towards the right, but still the, the, there are structures within Barasan National uh, that, you know, it's not far right. Um, it's somewhere in the middle. And Pakatan Harapan, uh, given the genesis of it, uh, reformasi, um, um, you know, so Pakatan Harapan, Ketuanan Rakyat, and because um, Bumi Putras are the majority, so you have, you know, a form of Ketuanan Melayu, but Ketuanan Rakyat uh, 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 is, is more ingrained. And then you have Perikatan National, which is Ketuanan Melayu Islam. Uh, none of these political parties are democratic in my view. Um, because challenging the leadership in any of these political parties uh, are hazardous. Um, so that's on the authoritarian and uh, ideolo party ideology. Now, in terms of uh, economic management, um, I have to say that all of these coalitions, uh, when you look at the aggregate indicators in Malaysia, GDP, uh, uh, national income, inflation, and so forth, the aggregate numbers are stable. Um, so there is no one, uh, uh, how do you say, one coalition that has managed Malaysia poorly. Now, there have been incidents, uh, but by and large, I mean, if you look at economic growth, now the COVID hit, uh, uh, there was a, you know, a, a recession, 5.6, but very quickly we recovered. Uh, so, which was uh, through good economic management of Perikatan National. Uh, and we, we recovered. So the fundamentals of Malaysia are sound uh, and, and, and all of these uh, coalitions have managed uh, the Malaysian economy well. Uh, which then comes to my last point about uh, what do we do uh, post GE15? Because there are fundamental issues that has plagued Malaysia, in fact, since the 1990s, which we have not addressed, or the structural issues. Now, as we have seen, Pakatan Harapan tried, failed, Barisan National have tried, Najib Razak tried, you know, the, the new economic model. Uh, because of legacy issues, uh, it's going to be extremely difficult for any coalition to bring about fundamental change. But on the vision for Malaysia, Perikatan National came about uh, because of Pakatan Harapan and supposedly uh, DAP or non-Muslims running the, the, the country. So Perikata National is, you know, is going to take Malaysia into a very conservative era. In fact, uh, Pahang, uh, Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin has said that PAS will be the next, uh, if uh, BN wins Pahang, uh, sorry, Perikata National wins Pahang, PAS will get to uh, rule uh, Pahang. So, you know, and PAS under Hadi, is very um, conservative. Uh, and Barisan National, uh, if you look at uh, some of the ideas that have come through the manifesto, um, Zahid has actually promised tax incentives for the private sector who encourage a multicultural management. Now that's interesting as an idea. I don't know if it will be legal, uh, but you can see BN is, you know, still has that, um, sort of multicultural approach. And then Pakatan Harapan, uh, as we said, structurally because of DAP and PKR, but also the genesis of Pakatan Harapan, which was its reform, reform Masi, it, it is the only coalition that has a reform agenda uh, uh, driving the coalition. Uh, back to you, Ken. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. That was very good, actually, um, to sketch out all of that. And I, I, I suppose I'm intrigued in a way in how you've presented it uh, graphically to see that Pakatan Harapan is the most centrist of the other two coalitions, um, but also which might uh, which of them might be most centered on some sort of a reality of where the political economy is right now. Um, I, I, think, I think there seems to be a lot of uh, commentary and uh, James, you've just confirmed this you know, yourself when you were saying in your opening that um, a lot of folks on the ground, despite the quite good uh, economic data that is coming out, 
um, are still struggling to recover from the pandemic's uh, first two years. Would that be right, James? I uh, guess. So if you speak to the ordinary people in Kuala Lumpur, uh, they will tell you that prices have risen across the board, especially uh, in this part of the world, people eat out all the time. So a lot of things are getting much more expensive. Uh, but the big items will be in the supermarkets. Uh, almost a lot of the consumer products you'll find in Malaysia actually imported and they're all denominated in US dollars. So the Malaysian ringgit versus the US dollars has really, really gone down. A uh, part of it has got to do with the fact that the US raised their interest rates. But uh, in terms of the Malaysia, uh, it has been falling for the past two years, but combined with the uh, hiking interest rates, it has really, uh, you know, it's really been a really, uh, uh, had a really big impact in, in, in supermarket prices. Uh, but I myself am shocked at some of the uh, prices of, of items at uh, shopping centers. One of the things about living in a clan valley and the major urban centers that people do a lot of mauling in the middle class. You know, on the weekends, they, they spend almost the entire day at, at shopping malls. Uh, they eat there, they shop there, they do everything there. And you'll find that uh, prices have, have really, really gone up. So uh, so the, the, the analogy I use is that, you know, uh, you know, for the middle class who used to go to Starbucks every weekend, uh, they may decide to, to order one less items every time they go to Starbucks. Uh, so it has really, really affected them. Uh, wages, interestingly enough, have not gone up. I've spoken to, uh, yesterday I was at an event with uh, university people and university students, and I was shot that a brand new uh, honors graduate in, in engineering from one of the top public universities in, in, in Malaysia. Uh, their starting salary at a major engineering firm is uh, 3,000 ringgit a month. Uh, those of you who live in Kuala Lumpur know that you can barely survive on, on 3,000 ringgit a month. So that, that is actually quite shocking to me. But it, it's this um, cost of living issue and the, is the economic issues of uh, inflation really that uh, lead a lot of people to wonder whether politics or good governance or government can actually solve any of these woes, right? Ira, I mean, you you and I have been talking a bit about this uh, disillusionment, if you like, with the whole political process where a lot of faith was shattered about even voting because of the so-called Sheraton uh, move in February 2020, which, you know, collapsed um, the reformist Pakatan Harapan government after not even two years, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, definitely wages is, uh, you know, probably at the top of the concerns uh, for young people, for fresh graduates. Um, I think our graduate unemployment, uh, you know, still remains to be at, at quite a worrying level. Um, and of course, you know, a lot of these problems are, are really just structural, right? So, um, you know, when we talk about wages, uh, of course, there are, uh, you know, there are the current economic um, uh, issues that affects all these things. But when you think about it, uh, you know, when you really sit down and really sort of are forced to think about the source of these problems, you know, it goes back to um, our universities, the education system, uh, you know, how uh, technology, technological um uh, adoption, I guess, of our industries, because, uh, you know, we are churning out graduates uh, with degrees that, um, you know, somehow do not have a place in, in, our, in, our, in our economy, right? So, you know, forcing us to ask all these questions of what jobs does our, does our economy actually need and what kind of um, graduates uh, that we are actually producing. Uh, so all of these are just really structural and, you know, the you know, going back to, to this issue of political parties and politicians, I mean, unfortunately, um, I, I don't think any of the coalitions that have uh, come and gone within the last two or three years, um, you know, I really have that kind of long-term thinking or long-term uh, vision or goal to really correct um, these problems in, uh, in, you know, at the sort of, um, at tackle the root causes of these problems. Um, yeah, you can't just put a band-aid on things and uh, expect everything to be okay. Um, I mean, the major coalitions, I think, have already released their manifestos. Um, I mean, this, this might sound a bit 
strange coming from someone who works in a think tank. But um, unfortunately, I think manifestos have kind of become they become something for a rather niche audience. I feel if you notice, like they can't even use the word manifesto anymore, right? So it's like it's either tawaran or iltizam or some other word that these coalitions are using for what is actually essentially a manifesto. And I think this is really, I, I, it's, it's a sign that I think the Buku Harapan uh, in, in 2018 uh, was a, you know, something that a lot of uh, civil society groups and academics kind of lauded as being uh, probably the first one that really had institutional reforms in it. But then I think unfortunately, because yeah, I mean, the, uh, the prime minister at the time himself even uh, sort of, you know, dismiss the importance of the manifesto. And of course, you know, I, I will not discount the fact that PH only had 22 months in power and literally just didn't have time to uh, complete uh, all those promises. But it's, it's so unfortunate that because of that now, yeah, I mean, I feel like manifesto has become a taboo word. So, you know, what are the uh, platforms or the sort of, um, yeah, what are the platforms available for, coalitions and parties to really be uh, policy oriented, right? I mean, I think we are still very far from that. Um, although the awareness, I think, has risen uh, over the years since PH, uh, since the PH government took over at the importance of uh, policies and uh, sort of this long-term thinking. Um, but I think, you know, the situation over the last two years uh, has uh, shown that um, yeah, there is very little willpower or political will, uh, which you know, I'm, which the, the, the term that is always used uh, is, is that, right? A, a lack of that. Um, so yeah, it, it, is, it is tough because uh, you know, there's balancing this whole notion of stability uh, with the fact that, that we can't run from, which is parties are fragmented, society has changed. And, you know, there are now a group of people, uh, you know, young people, new voters in the country that have very different uh, demands and uh, interests uh, compared to the previous generation. So how is the political situation changing with that, right? Um, yeah, so I think it's, it, I, would, I would really love to see that sort of push to a more policy oriented platform and discussions in our politics but I think it's a there's so many things that are holding that back really yeah from from happening thanks Ira um I, I think it's very funny that you should raise the issue of uh, contentious manifestos which barely anyone pays attention to and the tawaran or the offers that sound like a mega sale that we cannot miss out on which is sort of a slogan I, I did in publica a decade ago and now coming to bite us back in some ways. Uh, I was just curious, um, it is also time actually to encourage uh, as many of you who might can participate in this to send us some questions uh, through the Q&A function in the Zoom. Uh, I'm not sure how else we can see them, however, if someone can relay them off uh, Facebook as well. Uh, it would be good to get a, uh, try and answer some of these uh, in your next response, James and Greg as well. Uh, for instance, there's there's one here uh, which you know says, uh, given the multi-corner, you know, four to nine to ten corner fights, realistically, what are the chances for coalitions like Pakatan Harapan to form government, even with you know their claimed 80, 90 seats win? Because you need 112 to form government, so. And you have the anti-party hopping laws now, in a, uh, which you know hasn't really been passed. So how how do you actually form a legitimate or credible government, which of course we sort of need, right, to push through some of these quite tough reforms that are necessary if we are to get away from this uh, short-term problem thinking that Ira and uh, the rest of you have been raising, James. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, add on to what Ira said. I think it's very important that because we're speaking to the international audience, uh, manifestos have never been taken seriously in all the elections in Malaysia. 
Uh, basically, that's not the right way of talking about it because all of us here are talking, taking it very seriously because we are part of what we call the chartering class. The people who elect the government of Malaysia are in the rural areas of Sabah and Sarawak and the rural Malaysians. A manifesto has no meaning for them. So that's the reason why it has to be offers. What can you give me when I vote for you? Right, coming back to the question on, 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 on how do you put the coalition together, all right? I'll start off by saying that let's, let's listen to what the, the, the political parties are saying themselves. So Rafizi from Pakatan Harapan said that he's on track for 90. Uh, Barisan National said they're on track for 80. Perikatan, uh, they do not want to come out openly and say, but they did tell me that they're on track for about 70. So assuming that these guys are right, you add another 10% on top, uh, most of them are aiming for roughly around 90 to 100. So the magic is really to bring the people over from Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, GPS is in a solid position because they're on track for at least minimum 25. Now that may not sound a lot to you and me, but people keep forgetting 25 is more than 10% of the Malaysian parliament is a big block. Sabah will be split three ways. So you can assume that whichever block coming in, in Sabah will probably have about 10 to 15. So collectively, the two biggest blocks in Sabah and Sarawak will be coming in with roughly uh, to more than 36. So they may even reach 46, so about 20% of the block. Now, the way it works in Malaysia is that 112 is actually not an important figure. 112 is actually a figure that's looking for trouble because it will not be stable. The sort of starting point for stability in the system is 120. 130, then you can smile a lot, go out, makan angin. The big number, the magic number in Malaysia they're looking for, which they won't get, is 148. With 148, you're the king of the hill, can do whatever you want, because that is the number that, that allows you to amend the constitution. So in terms of political stability, I'm looking for a government that's 120 and above. It is actually very easy to put the coalition together at 120. It is not a problem. Uh, putting together the coalition is, is not a problem. The problem is how do you divide up the ministry, divide up the spoils of government? And that is a much bigger problem uh, because here we're talking about economic stuff and all that sort of thing. Uh, in terms of the investments, uh, investors and people looking into money in Malaysia, right? They're actually not looking for much. They're just looking for political consistency, consistent economic policy. But more importantly, they want to look for rational actors in charge of economic policies. One of the problems we had in Malaysia is that very often some of the ministers appointed to key economic posts have not been very consistent and uh, for lack of a better word, and I'm going to get in trouble, but I'll say it anymore, they've been practicing more and more economics. So this is not what investors want. Uh, so I think we have to be very clear what we're talking about here. Uh, for me, putting a coalition together is not a problem. Uh, it is because uh, everybody wants to be in government. In, in, in Malaysia, being in government means you have access to all sorts of resources. So that's the reason why even past an Islamic party wants to be in government, or in fact, they're desperate to be in government. The problem is that how do you, uh, how do you run a coalition government so that it is stable? So I'm suggesting that all of them are looking at numbers of 120 and above. Yes, exactly. Greg, um, you have actually done some rough calculations on possible coalition numbers on this in the you know, conversations about you know, how do you get enough numbers to do a legitimate or credible government so that we can actually you know, develop policy that actually has better long-term implications. So um, my view is that uh, Malaysia will be in for a few more years of instability. Um, um, I, I don't think, um, so, so given the, uh, you know, the factors that I've, that I've put out just now, the, the nature of the, the leaders of these political parties, um, except for, for, for PASS, um, which has a, a long-term goal of making Malaysia an Islamic state, and therefore it can work, you know, it can work, it has worked with DAP when it was convenient, it has worked with PKR when it was convenient. It has worked with AMNO. It's worked with, with Bersatu. In fact, it wanted to continue to work with AMNO and Bersatu. So for PAS, its ideology drives its strategies. 
So it's very clear on what it wants. And it's even prepared to wait out. Uh, so yes, they want to be in government, but you know, they're, they're prepared to seed ground as long as this greater agenda uh, uh, is uh, it, it eventuates. So PASS is certain about that. Not so with the other political parties. Um, and you know, even PKR. Um, being in power is important. Uh, rather than the sort of an ideology or a vision uh, uh, for Malaysia and, and that I'm prepared to defend it in opposition. Um, so, so because of the nature of the leadership of these political parties uh, and the lack of ideology, um, and because economic management, you know, we, we, we're still doing well, I would say you know, 3%, 4% growth uh, are, are better than, than the average in Southeast Asia. Um, despite the points uh, that both Ira and James made earlier, um, in fact, there is a World Bank survey in May 2020 that said uh, nearly 60% of households felt that they were not at all or only partially able to, re to cover their monthly basic needs. Share of households with no savings has increased from 16% to 21%. Um, so there, you know, at the ground level, things are terrible. But this is also why populism works. Uh, all the, the manifestos or these promises, none of them are costed, okay, which then brings in this, this other bigger issue you know, operational expenditure of a budget, uh, a very narrow uh, income stream, uh, primarily from, from fossil fuel uh, and an export market, which, which is increasingly becoming competitive. Uh, yet our human capital is not, have not been able to, to really adapt to these this changes. So, but because none of this, with the exception of PASS, none of the other political parties have actually a long-term vision nor a leader who have long-term vision. So they will be cutting deals. Um, and I think the Malaysian electorate is themselves uncertain because there's really no point of differentiation. Um, and so this is where networks, uh, how closely you are able to get your vote, that voter out, how good your grassroots infrastructure is, is going to, to, to really matter. So I, uh, I don't see stability uh, in a formal coalition for the next five years. Mm, thanks, Greg. Um, it sounds almost as grim as what Ira was sort of explaining previously. <laughs> um, I, I was I was just curious, Ira. In, you know, um, there are the several of these um, issues which are like so-called many elephants in the room. I mean, there's the climate emergency, which is of course affecting people in the Klang Valley right now, uh, amongst other places. Um, there is the remarkable um, reversal and going backwards in a way of uh, women uh, candidates compared to the previous elections. Uh, there is obviously the rising inequality, which uh, aren't really told in the GDP figures. Um, so there are a couple of these um, other issues, right, Ira, that um, we were looking at. And I, I also see some of these uh, questions here, the Q&As on the side here, where, you know, for instance, can a lot of this be linked to the corruption of the whole governing process? Yeah, I wanted to just uh, quickly answer that question on corruption. Um, if you look at the uh, social media and also the uh, Cheramas that's been going on during the campaign. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, you know, these politicians, you know, will say that corruption is their, you know, the main thing that we need to fight. I just read an article where Azmin was saying um, all the other coalitions have corrupt leaders except for PN, you know, so this sort of um, grandstanding on, uh, you know, we are less corrupt than the other coalition is uh, central at you know all the political campaigns, but what I'm afraid of uh, when corruption is being talked about in this way, and actually it's quite similar to 2018 with the whole um, you know the anger at Najib and one MB. Um, of course, it is good that you know politicians are going out there and telling people that uh, corruption is bad, 
But my fear is when it's talked about in this way, it becomes, uh, you know, you hate the individual and not the problem of corruption in itself. Um, right? So, you know, because, and, and when we, we talk about corruption, of course, it's, it's easy to imagine uh, the, the court cases and the billions, um, you know, that's lost. Um, I mean, it's not easy to imagine billions being lost because you know most Malaysians out there don't have billions but what I mean is uh, it's very visible it's in the news every day and you you can read about it but you know corruption is a, a mixture of many things right um, corruption is also about uh, the wrong incentives that is in our political system right so our our politicians and our political system is ran with is, is fueled by um, all the wrong incentives, right? So uh, politicians are, uh, you know, need to have a lot of money because, you know, our political system is ran by, uh, you know, among, amongst them is being ran by, uh, you know, personal relationships between MPs, adduns, and also voters, where, you know, there is a need for you to hand out cash when you go to weddings and funerals and open houses and all kinds of, um, uh, turun padang activities or going down to the ground activities that our politicians need to do. Uh, you just need to go look at the campaign uh, pages of all our candidates at the moment and that literally that's all they, they do right during during campaigning. So where are they getting this money from right? Um, I don't think many people pay attention to that or even want to know where they're getting that money from. So there's there's the we need to see you need to see how political system is incentivized and for me the incentives are all wrong so painting corruption as just being about zahid or about najib um yeah it risks just it it risks the uh problem of corruption being just about individuals and not what it is uh at a deeper level secondly the question on women candidates uh, so this is a good question i think oh, yeah wow we could do a whole other webinar just talking about women participation in politics that's my other pet topic besides political financing um this is related to i think the candidate selection issue right um at the end of the day uh you know there is this because our political parties are just so extremely hierarchical that uh you know if you are a woman candidate it is if you're a woman candidate, if you, in, if you are not a ketua bahagian or you're not a ketua wanita bahagian uh, or you know something of that sort, then uh, it is even extremely difficult to for you to get a seat and for you to get a winnable seat. Uh, and if you notice, uh, wanita, I think someone from wanita Amno spoke up and said that you know what happened to BN's promise of putting thirty percent women candidate. I mean, if wanita Amno is speaking out, then it's it's bad, I think, right? Because what the I'm not really speaks out like that about about issues, uh, internal issues. So it shows that it is bad, and uh, yeah, it is really disappointing. And for me, honestly, we need to get rid of women's wings in political parties. Like you know, if you keep this the current system that we have now, then women are always just going to be in boxes and the, it just reinforces gender roles in politics actually um yeah so i think i'll just stop there thanks thanks ira um james you you wanted to add to that oh uh, no <laughs> okay i thought you were wanting to do this oh no the, the the point i wanted to make was that all the political parties actually promised to, to to work towards the target of 30% women uh, representations. Uh, that's been more than 10 years they've made that commitment already and nothing has happened. In fact, women's representation has never gone beyond, well, it has never gone beyond even half of that 15%. Mm. Yes, so we haven't really progressed actually. Um, I, I just thought we should try and answer a couple of these uh, questions that have come in. Uh, one is about referencing a quote from uh, the Malaysianist, uh, Dr. Elvin Ong, that uh, claims that Malaysia is on the cusp of being a normal democracy. What uh, all of you think about what, what is a normal democracy? Uh, the other question, uh, which we can try and attempt, is um, from Chako uh, Varikath in KL about whether Harapan, Pakatan Harapan, has alienated its base and its voters. voters um, 
by removing popular candidates, uh, many of whom are active or known in civil society, like Charles Santiago, Silva Rasa, Maria Chin, Tian Chua, or even, even uh, fielding unknowns into what are considered safe progressive seats. There is also um, another, I think, question that's linked to this uh, about what are the chances of um, Pakatan Harapan forming government if there's no clear winner? I think that's partly been touched upon now. Would uh, any of you like to tackle those questions? I'll probably uh, connect this to the, to, to the points that I had made uh, in my opening statement. So two structural issues plague, or in my view, plague uh, the electoral competition. Uh, one is communalism, um, and, and the political parties are, are formed to address communal issues. And then this dysfunctional electoral system that amplifies these communal issues. Now that then plays out uh, into the political parties and, and candidate selection. Now there are certainly other variables, but this structural issues around communalism uh, and then how, you know, what James said, um, over-representation of Sabah, Sarawak and, and rural areas. Um, so it, in effect, you know, it's not one vote, one Malaysian citizen. Uh, uh, so, you know, so, so in that sense, uh, Malaysia uh, is a, a dysfunctional democracy. Uh, but it's un, it's not unusual uh, in the United States. You know, we, we have all these problems. Now, in, in terms of selection of uh, political candidates, yeah, um, on the one hand, although we have seen sort of instability since 2018, for the longest time, uh, we had very stable, a very stable, uh, a bit authoritarian political system, which which sufficient amount of of competition. So this instability is is due to, uh, in my view, the changing nature of society uh, and 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 attempting society attempting to find its expression and and a legacy political regime or system uh, trying to adapt to that, um, but. Because we have stable political parties who have their own ways of selecting candidates, fairly or unfairly, uh, that's the system we are part of. Um, so yes, it's unfortunate that Charles Santiago, uh, Sivarasa, uh, um, Maria Chin uh, have been removed. <laughs> but it's also unfortunate that Kairi Jamaluddin <laughs> has to go to uh, you know, it's it's and and you know, uh, stalwarts, uh, senior AMNO uh, candidates being removed, and and yes, definitely unfair that women who are I think close to uh, the majority in, in terms of the electorate, if, if I'm not wrong, has is so underrepresented. So, so these are the kind of structural issues that you know I I I hope our political leaders are, are thinking through and, and civil society, uh, think tanks uh, and, and so forth. Uh, we will need to address this changing society uh, and, and the political system has to change. Otherwise, this instability uh, will go on. Back to you, Ken. We'll try and answer a few more questions before we run out of time as well. Um, just looking here, there is this other question of whether um, the who might well be the likely next PM. I, I realize that our, our conversations um, have less been about the personalities of the good old um, Anwar versus Mahate versus Muidin versus now possibly the return of Najib or Muidin, uh, I mean, um, Ismail Sabri. I think there was a question earlier in our Q and A where there is—is is there such a thing as a Najib factor? And um, 
and also who I guess the likely PM might be. Uh, and what I suppose is a good <laughs> open question here from Su Ching Li is what should normal look like after these elections? Um, would any of you like to tackle any of these, please? Okay, uh, since nobody wants to answer, I'll answer all the controversial things. In terms of the prime minister nominee, to me, it's really not, there's no, really nothing controversial. We, we know who's going to be the prime minister. So if Pakatan wins, it will be Anwar Ibrahim. And in terms of Barisan National, it depends on the margin of victory. If Barisan doesn't need any more new, new partners to come in to help them hold up the government, the prime minister will be uh, uh, Zahid. So again, no question. Uh, Perikatan, no question, because they they're not gonna they're not gonna be in the position to to gobble a coalition together. And in terms of uh, GTA, uh, Mahate is facing retirement, so I, I I think basically the only game in town is Barisan National versus Pakatan Harapan. Yeah. Clear enough. Okay, I um yeah just as a counterpoint to to James um um. Like I said, it's normal will be f fluid. So more of more of what we we saw uh, the past four or five years because these leaders are just uh, so Zahid is fighting for his life. Uh, and there are <laughs> Najib, Rosma, uh, and a whole bunch of other uh, Barisa national uh, leaders, uh, you know, or not fighting for their life, but uh, don't want to be in jail. Uh, so even if they lose, they're not going to give up. Uh, they will continue to destabilize. And because of Barisa National Amno's long history, uh, Pati Kerajaan, they still have those deep, uh, deep uh, roots uh, uh, into public sector uh, and, and you know GLCs and so forth. Pass. As, as part of, of uh, Perikata National is, prop, in my view, the strongest uh, grassroots party after uh, AMNO. And in recent years, because of what has happened to AMNO's credibility, uh, they have actually sort of uh, uh, expanded. Uh, if, if, you, if you listen to Bridget Wells' uh, 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 latest uh, 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 talk, um, so, so they have been, you know, and this is past long term, uh, prepared to do the hard yards. You know, they've they've, you know, their club, uh, their amal. You know, they've got their unit amal. Uh, they take over pe uh, parent teacher associations. They tadikas. Uh, they provide, you know, very personalized what Amno used to do. Uh, uh, so, pass and Amno uh, have strong grassroots um, uh, movements. Uh, that even if they lose, you know, they will play a, a hard game. Uh, Pakatan Harapan found out how difficult it is uh, to, to, to dislodge um, those, those long-standing ties. So um, I do not know who the prime minister will be, <laughs> but he won't last very long, <laughs> uh, in my view, uh, whoever who, 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 be, who, who becomes the prime minister. So, Greg, are you saying that whoever is elected the prime minister after this GE15 won't last very long? Uh, that's uh, my view, yeah. Mm. For those reasons that I put uh, in my opening remarks. Th th there so is even no... if Zahid becomes the prime minister and Amno has a majority, Zahid won't last very long? Um, yeah, so, so that's based on an assumption that uh, BN will get 130, 140. Uh, and, and so my I'm what I'm saying is that assumption. Uh, uh, I, so I don't make that assumption. I, 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 so you mentioned earlier, you know, 80, 90, 90, each of those coalitions um, uh, on their own right, they might get that points. And then to cobble uh, 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 a coalition to get into that. So Sabah and so Sarwa, uh, as you know, uh, they would they would support anyone, uh, I think. Uh, and you mentioned they won't support Perikatan National, so which means either BN or Pakatan Harapan. Uh, Sabah is split. Um, I think it's 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 more complicated uh, 
uh, then you know th that ability. I think forming coalition is a complicated process. Uh, that's that's my view, yeah. mm -hmm. and and therefore who who becomes prime minister is 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 fraught, unless some new form of thinking around how parliament and government should work uh, uh, is is established. Um, so, so that's uh, it's just a proposition uh, of view that I have. Yeah. Since we're running close to the wire and out of time, I guess um it really is up to Ira to give us the uh, great predictive insight who actually might be the prime minister, Ira, and uh, who would be preferable. Who would be preferable? Oh gosh, um, yeah, that's uh, I I I I. I don't know if none of the above is an option, but um, I mean, for me, I think, you know, if Pakatan Harapan by some, you know, miracle manages to um, dislodge everyone's predictions and manages to form a government, um, I mean, look, uh, I think, uh, you know, Anwar Ibrahim, many things has been said about him and, uh, you know, all his attempts to become prime minister, but I feel like, I feel like you know the the as Malaysians we just need to we just need to go through that phase where you know he gets to become prime minister or else I think there will be just just so much baggage and just so much you know toxic history that we cannot get over if if that doesn't happen um you know so uh you know if PH gets to be gets to form a government, I think, you know, it, it's time that uh, he gets to play that role uh, that he has wanted for a long time. Um, yeah, uh, but, you know, all predictions are saying that that's not going to happen. Uh, they're not, they, they won't be able to form that government. So, yeah, I mean, but I, I think just to add on to that, um, what the last two years has shown, uh, at least from a civil society perspective, is that you know, when we have a weak prime minister, uh, you know, the prime minister is in a weak position, it actually presents opportunities for reform, you know. So I think whoever the prime minister is, uh, if we go by what Greg said, you know, it, you know he, will be, he will not be in a strong position. Um, I think that's the time when civil society needs to come in and really push through the reforms that we have been asking for for all these years, right? So I think the instability and the weak prime minister um, will probably be the new normal, but that will also open, I think, windows and doors of opportunity. So that is that is my hope, whoever the person will be. Yeah. Great. Have you got a prediction? Um, not really, no. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Looking, looking at the the situation now. I mean, I, I think it will be the end who will have the sort of, uh, what what's the term for it? First mover advantage to form a government. Yeah. Maybe the casting vote, huh? Yeah, yeah. There you go. Mm. And what what should we look at in terms of? I'm uh, just looking at some of these questions, uh, James. This is something that I think you've discussed in the past, is there any possibility that there would be a deputy PM from Sabah or Sarawak? Oh, that is a done deal. If either Pakatan or Barisan gets in, uh, there will be a deputy prime minister uh, from Sabah or Sarawak. It's a done deal. Right. Okay. So that, that th this is where uh, this uh, so-called kingmaker view of the Borneo states come in? James? Uh, what? Sorry. I, I mean, did you ask me a question? Oh, I thought no, that was no. a comment. I thought that was a comment saying that Sabah Sarawak became maker. Oh, sorry. I, I, I know you feel quite strongly about that particular point. Uh, but me? That's fine. Well, I gave you the idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, all I said was that the preference among the political class of Sabah and Sarawak is that they do not want a strong federal government mm -hmm. because they're afraid of being marginalized again, which is a reasonable point. And given the history they have faced uh, when, when, when uh, Barisan National was very strong, uh, it is understandable why they feel that way. Mm -hmm. I think to conclude uh, our discussion, 
perhaps we could try and uh, attempt to see if we can forecast some sort of near future post uh, November 19 is one, I guess we've all decided uh, or concluded that there won't be any one overwhelming uh, coalition and a lot of horse trading or deal making will have to happen. But two, what, what are the um, outstanding issues backdrop that they'll have to be dealt with? I mean, we've touched on many of those economic challenges that are, are there, but there are also some societal and political ones, aren't there? And, and the more longstanding issue of, uh, say, Pass's uh, own religious political uh, agenda, right? Uh, it, it, would any of you like to sort of, you know, comment about what we should expect after November 19, aside from the uncertain deal making? Uh, my uh, position is, uh, sorry, Greg, go ahead. Thanks, James. So, so we, we'll need to put, uh, my, my take will be, we'll need to put Malaysia within the international context. So we currently have a recalibration of the international order, um, US, China, um, and then Russia, Europe, Russia, Europe, US. Um, so this recal recalibration, uh, you know, um, uh, has will have impacts, will have impact on Malaysia. Um, the sort of technological war, uh, tariff war between China and the US uh, will have economic implications. Um, we've been fortunate so far, Malaysia, um, as uh, in in sort of reaping benefits uh, that that have been created, but you know if if this global uh, confrontation doesn't go well, uh, there will be a repercussion all over. Then in the shorter term, uh, the inflation rate in the U.S. Uh, will have significant effect, and and we already see that in the uh, the, the Malaysian currency. Uh, uh, becoming weaker to the U.S. Now, so more long-standing issue: household debt has been growing st steadily, uh, from eighty percent of GDP uh, in twenty seventeen to now ninety-three uh, or in twenty twenty ninety-three percent. Uh, inflation, especially related to food uh, and energy, uh, has been increasing. Um, unemployment, although considered normal. Uh, Four percent, but still uh, the underemployment, underemployment, and 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 more importantly, employment that doesn't pay well, pay a, a decent wage. So this is the issue, and then let's not forget climate change. <laughs> Good Lord, we're having an election um, in a month in the monsoon season that will, you know, in a way, be front and center of many Malaysians. Um, uh, and then all these promises that have been made uh, that will have uh, fiscal implications. Um, so all the manifestos talk about what the governments will or uh, coalitions will do. They don't talk about how will it be financed, um, which is the other side of the balance. So, you know, I, I, I like what Ira is saying. Um, Hopefully, <laughs> this this gives an opportunity one for the coalitions to find some middle ground, something like that memorandum of understanding, you know, uh, parliamentary select committees, uh, parliament becomes uh, more effective, uh, and in through that process, civil society uh, and now. Uh, provides that sort of pro bono um, uh, and also uh, honest broker, uh, you know, sort of intellectual arguments based on, 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 you know, remove the politics in, 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 the, in the policy making and, and sort of here's the best idea. Okay. Now you politicians go and sort that out. So, yeah. So Malaysia is a very open economy uh, that, that will have, a significant impact, and we need to manage our our fiscal, uh, uh, fisc you know, our <laughs> fiscal uh, management is going to be very very important. Thanks again. Thanks, Greg. Um, I guess um, we 
do you have any final words, James, in KL and Ira yes. in New York? Uh, yes, I just want to say that uh, there will no, there will not be any political instability on the nineteenth or the twentieth. There will be a prime minister that will be sworn in. Uh, I think all this talk about political instability is because people uh, don't understand that when it comes to elections, uh, all the things that has been discussed this hour, while interesting. Uh, has no bearing because among the elites themselves, the only game in town is the numbers game. So uh, all this thing that we're talking about is actually not on their mind. It's only on the mind of the bouncer crowd, the chattering class. Uh, so basically the bottom line for me is that we will have political stability. The numbers will be cobbled together on the 19th. But the prime minister will be sworn in and there will be a government uh, uh, going forward. Uh, as to the issue that great race about our, our political instability and the prime minister being weak, uh, you know, over the short term, whatever it is, uh, this was not this would not happen. Uh, the reason is because uh, the elites understand that the the system or the the turbulence that we had over the last few years uh, has not worked for anybody, including themselves. Uh, so the, I my understanding is that there's already a minimum understanding among uh, all sides about how to proceed. Uh, the mm -hmm. issue about uh, uh, manifestos and how they're going to fund for it, uh, this has never been an issue because in the Malaysian system, it's always been an issue of making promises because people here forget easily. Uh, you know, so so I I I I don't want to put anybody down, but I'm just saying that that is not the reality. How politics is is, is actually run? Of course, uh, people like us, the chattering class, we can uh, talk left and right, but I'm saying that that is not how it actually uh, works in practice. How it actually works in practice is that uh, the senior ministers and how powerful the individuals are carve up the resources for their own ministry. And, you know, so that's the reason why I, just now when I talk about uh, governments, the appointment of key ministers is, is, is really important. I know. So, for example, in, in, in this government, right, uh, we know that Ismail Sabri is, is, is supposedly the prime minister, but in terms of the, the, the power, uh, application of power, Hamza names always floats up because he's very powerful. So I, I think we need a bit of realism. I'm trying to introduce a bit of realism into this, <laughs> this discussion. Uh, so, uh, so look, I am, uh, it's interesting because in everywhere else, people say that I'm not the optimistic person. I always say bad things about it, but it appears that in, in this forum, I'm actually the, the, the really optimistic person. Uh, there will be political stability and there will be a government form on the 19th or the, 20, or the 20th of November. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Ira, you have the last word. Um, okay, thanks. Um, I mean, I I hope I, I think for me more than anything, um, in the, the lead up to these elections uh, has really, really, you know, thrown up front and center, you know, how unreflective our political class is of Malaysian society, of the new the aspirations of young people especially you know our politics has remained to be you know static unmovable extremely hierarchical you know really really closed off to change and diversity and that really has stood out to me more than anything and i really hope that you know with the entrance of new parties and uh with you know greater awareness amongst young people who have resources at their fingertips um that slowly 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 that sort of that that dial will start to move uh however little uh to yeah to make our politics just more reflective of changing times and uh i don't think our political leaders have a choice um you know all around the world this the, the call is is there right for for politics to just be more reflective of society and of what people want uh, so i really hope uh this is a, a, the small start that we can make towards that um yeah so that's that's my that's my hope thank you thanks ira and uh happy voting everyone uh, those of you watching as well um and thanks very much to the uh, sydney southeast asia center at sydney university and masa the Malaysia Singapore Society of Australia, which is an affiliate of the Asian Studies Association of Australia, uh, for helping organize and hosting this. Um, thanks, James. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Ira, for joining thanks, us. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, James. Thanks, Ira.
Thanks, Ira, especially. Uh, way past your bedtime, I know. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Cheers. But, uh, you, you'll, be, you'll be back in the kampong day after tomorrow, there, thereabouts anyway, right? So. Yeah, well, time difference means Monday. It's only Monday morning, I'll get back to KL. So, yeah. Okay. Happy voting, All right. everyone. Happy voting, Thanks, everyone. everyone. Cheers. Bye. Bye.